Library. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Dr. DeMarte, you are still under oath. Do you understand? Yes. You may continue with cross-examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Good morning, Dr. DeMarte. We, let's talk about some of the things that you had to say with fight versus flight, okay? Okay. Uh, you told us that when a person is in a fight versus flight episode, that it's a physiological response, right? There is a physiological response that occurs. And it's something, because it's a physiological response, that means that it has something to do with our bodies, right? Correct. And that's not something we can help? It's a, a response to fear, yes, it happens automatically. Okay, so we, can, we can't help what our body does, right? Correct. And um, when we talk about what our body does, it, the physiological response has an effect on our brains, right? Yes. And you're familiar with the part of the brain called the hippocampus? I am. And part of what the hippocampus does is deal we, dealing with short-term memories, right? I wouldn't use those words. Okay, what would you use? What the hippocampus does is it encodes information from the short-term memory to long-term memory. As I described it before, I think about it as a hallway. Okay, and so the short-term memories are in the hippocampus, and at some point they have to be encoded to the other parts of the brain to make form long-term memories, right? Correct. Okay, and so during this fight versus flight type of response, the hippocampus, there's, there's neurotransmitters that are released in our brains, right? Correct. And those neurotransmitters are things like adren adrenaline? Yes. Norepinephrine? Yes. And is it dopamine is the other one? Dopamine, cortisol is also released. Okay. And so all those things get released into our brain, right, when yes. we get in, go into a fight or flight situation. Yes. And what happens is, is it then floods the hippocampus, doesn't it? Yes. Those neurotransmitters. Yes. Right? And so when the hippocampus is flooded with those neurotransmitters, uh, it ultimately causes a problem with it uh, forming or keeping those short-term memories to be able to encode them to other parts of the brain, doesn't it? There's some interference. Some interference. Okay, meaning that there ca it causes a problem with taking those short-term memories and encoding them into long-term memories, right? Yes, it can cause some problems. Right. So in other words, these short-term memories um, are not going to always get into our long-term memory, right? Not all of them. Okay. Uh, and sometimes not any of them during this period of time, right? That's not typical. It happens, doesn't it? That's not typical. I understand that you're saying it's not typical, but it happens, right? Anything's possible, but it's not probable. Okay. So um, what you're saying then is that when the hippocampus is flooded, sometimes it can have some of the memories and sometimes it may not. Usually there's some memory that's there. Okay. And there's some memory you're saying that then can be encoded for long-term memories. Yes despite all the neurotransmitters that have flooded the hippocampus. Right, it causes interference. Right, okay. So when a person goes into this fight or flight response, um, their, the higher brain activity starts to, uh, is affected, isn't it? Are you referring to executive functions? Yes. Yes. Okay, and, and that's on purpose, isn't it? That's the way we're created? Can you restate that question in a different way? No, I mean, it's, that's the way that the brain is meant to work, right? What's the way that the brain's meant to work? The executive functions are limited so that we can go into survival mode. So if I understand your question, you're saying in a fight or flight mode, the reason why they go into a limited ability is so that we can survive. Is that what you're asking? Yeah, I mean, it goes to survival. It helps us survive, right? So we can, so that basically we go into a specific type of mode so that that way the only focus of the body and the brain is to survive. Yes, that is correct. Okay. And just because some of the executive functions of our brains are shut down, it doesn't make a person into a walking idiot, right? That's correct. Uh, they're able to function, aren't they? Depends on how you're defining function. Well, they're able to continue walking around. Yes, gross motor movement is continued to be seen. All right. And they're able to defend themselves, aren't they? And what do you mean by defend themselves? Survive. They're able to survive if it's successful? Yes. They're able to do that, right? If it's successful. Well, they're able to attempt to survive, right? Attempt to survive, yes. Okay. And by attempting to survive, they're able to attempt to defend themselves. Jackson, the court ruling. Approach, please. All right. 
So when we go into this fight or flight mode, right? The whole point is to survive. That's correct. Okay. And so when that means that the ability that we still as humans have the ability to defend ourselves, right? If that's the mechanism that's being used, there's fight or flight. Right. So if if flight isn't going to work and the person has to stay and fight, that's the point of this whole mode within our brains to be able to attempt to defend ourselves, right? What typically happens is that they engage in either fight or flight. Right. I know that. But what I'm saying is is that when we're talking about if we're not going to flight, if there's no flight, then we're talking about fight. So if we're talking about fight, that means that our brains are intended so that we can attempt to defend ourselves, right? Yes. Okay. When the hippocampus gets flooded with these neurotransmitters, um, at some point, these neurotransmitters are going to recede from the brain and kind of go, to what, go away after a while, right? Go back to normal levels. Yes. And when that happens, the hippocampus, you're not telling us that the hippocampus is destroyed, right? When they go back to normal? Yeah, once the neurotransmitters kind of recede and your brain starts to function in a normal sense again, the hippocampus is generally still intact, right? What I explained before was that if there's prolonged exposure, that you can see damage. But typically when, the, when it does drop to normative levels, you don't see continued damage. Okay. So in, on direct, you talked about uh, seeing atrophy, right? Yes. And so you're saying that when the hippocampus is uh, under prolonged levels of these neurotransmitters, then you start to see atrophy? That it's possible to see atrophy. And is that something that happens a lot? No. Okay. And uh, when the hippocampus atrophies, that's when people tend to have long-term memory problems, right? That's when they have difficulty through the encoding process, taking new information and encoding it into long-term memory. All right. And when you talk about atrophy, that's something that we see in, in diseases like, um, um, well, diseases that cause memory issues, like Alzheimer's, right? That's one area. Okay. And... With atrophy, though, I know that you, you noted on direct that you didn't notice any type of atrophy issues with Miss Arias's hippocampus, right? You didn't see any evidence of that? I certainly did not examine her hippocampus. I don't have the ability to do that. What I said was that I don't, did not see any continued memory problems that would be suggestive of okay. an atrophied hippocampus. All right. So you're not suggesting that her hippocampus was somehow atrophied, right? Right. I, I did not examine okay. her hippocampus. And when the hippocampus is flooded with these neurotransmitters and these short-term memories then aren't encoded into the long-term memory, that's not something that these memories are ever going to come back, right? Because they were never encoded. There may be some memories that will never come back. I'm speaking specifically of memories, short-term memories, that never get encoded to long-term memories. So if they're never encoded, there's nothing there to, for the person to retrieve. Don't you agree? I understood your question. Do you agree with that? Some then? of those memories, yes, I agree with that. You're saying some of those memories. What I'm asking, though, is that if we have a group of memories, for the sake of argument, let's label them A, B, and C. A, B, and C get into the hippocampus as short-term memories. The hippocampus is then flooded with neurotransmitters. A, B, and C memories don't get encoded to the brain as long-term memories. Right? Are you understanding so far? I think you're using different language than I am. You're using an all or nothing, and I'm saying that there's interference that occurs. I'm not using all or nothing. I'm specifically speaking of, of specific memories, labeling them A, B, and C. If they are not encoded into long-term memory, we're not going to ever get the memories of A, B, and C back, right? Right, if those memories were not encoded, correct. Okay, all right. Now you talked about uh, Miss Arias deleting photos, right? Yes. But you certainly didn't watch the testimony in this trial, right? No. And... So you don't have any information about who deleted these photos, right? Right. Well, it was in the police records. You think it was in the police records that Miss Arias deleted the photos? Well, that there was photos that were deleted. Right. But on direct, you talked about the photos that were deleted by Miss Arias. I'm asking you, where did that information come from? What I just highlighted, that uh, on the police records, that there were photos that were deleted. Yes, but in the police records, it doesn't say that Miss Arias deleted the photos, does it? Her specifically, 
I don't recall. Okay. So on direct, then you're assuming that Ms. Arias deleted the photos? Yes. Okay. So it's just an assumption on your part? Based on the evidence that I had, the records that I had. But there are no records that actually say she deleted the photos? Just that the photos were deleted. Okay. And you don't know when these photos were deleted, right? They were deleted when they were found. Right. But you don't know if they were deleted before the attack or after Mr. Alexander attacks her. Objection. Um, assumes facts not in evidence, i.e. Mr. Alexander attacked her. Those facts are in evidence. As to that objection, rephrase. You don't know when these photos were deleted, whether it was before Mr. Alexander jumped out of the shower at Miss Arias, right? Objection. As soon as facts are in evidence. It, that he jumped out of her. It was testified to. Overall, do me answer. Can you ask that again? Sure. You don't know if these photos were deleted before Mr. Alexander got out of the shower and went after Miss Arias, right? Again, objection. You don't know if he went after her. That's her testimony. Uh, may continue. Thank you. Uh, Dr. DeMarte, what I'm trying to ask you is whether or not you have any knowledge that these photos that were deleted, if they were deleted before Mr. Alexander came out of the shower and went after Ms. Arias. Objection. Ladies and gentlemen, you are directed to recall the evidence you heard during this trial. You may continue. According to the records, the photos that were deleted were those of him in the shower? And that would suggest that it was after the killing. Okay. And there was also other photos on there as well, too? I'm aware of that. Okay. And the photos of take it, that Mr. Alexander took of Miss Arias, right? Yes. And those photos were taken earlier in the day? Yes. And do you, you don't have any knowledge as to when those photos de were deleted, right? That's correct. And you don't have any knowledge as to how many total photos were taken, right? That's correct. So you don't know which ones might have been taken and deleted and some were kept, right? Say that again. You don't know which photos would it, might have been deleted before Mr. Alexander came out of the shower uh, or whether or not they were deleted afterwards, um, which ones were deleted and then some might have been deleted and then retaken, more taken. Well, based on time, the photos of him in the shower were the last photos and I know those were deleted. The deleted upon uh, getting the camera, right? When police received the camera? Yes. And the photos, um, you're aware that, that Miss Arias is a photographer, right? Yes. And she liked to take photos? Yes. And she did it quite a bit, didn't yes. she? In fact, she's taken photos for weddings? Yes, I heard her say that. You heard her say that? In the uh, police uh, interrogation. Okay. And so then... So you know then that she is familiar with cameras, right? Yes. And would be familiar with digital cameras? Presumably. Okay. So somebody who's familiar with these things wouldn't be such a difficult thing to delete photos if they're familiar with the item, right? Objection, Dr. Foundation. Sustained. Okay. So let's... You were asked questions about organization and planning, right? Correct. And uh, you were asked these questions talking about after Mr. Alexander was killed, right? Correct. You talked about the fact that the scene seemed to be somewhat cleaned up. There was some cleaning? According to the police records. All right. And you saw the photos, didn't you? Yes. Uh, and you talked about the fact that... Um, that uh, there was no weapon at the scene, right? Found? Correct. Okay. But in the photos you can see that whatever cleaning that may or may not have been done, the person didn't do a good job, right? Objection, Rule 702, 703. It doesn't take an expert. Approach, approach. All right, so you're familiar with the, with the photos taken of the scene, right? Yes. And in seeing those photos of the scene, you can tell that the scene certainly wasn't clear.
cleaned completely, was it? It was not cleaned completely. Okay. And there was a lot of uh, evidence or blood left <laughs> at the scene, wasn't there? The photos that I saw was that there was a lot of blood on the carpet. Mm -hmm. I saw that, and I saw that there was some blood on the sink, and I saw that there was very little blood surrounding Mr. Alexander. In the shower? In the shower. Okay. Uh, but there was blood on the bathroom floor and th things of that nature, right? The photos that I saw were, again, the sink and the carpet. Okay. So you didn't see all the photos then? I don't, I don't know how to answer that question because I don't know if there's others. Okay, so you don't know if you saw them all, is what you're saying? I just told you the ones I saw. Okay, so you saw three? Um, I saw several of Mr. Alexander. Okay, all right. And when we're talking about um, executive function versus lower function, when we're talking about the brain, right? When we're talking about being in fight or flight mode, okay? Okay. We, we talk about, we talk about um, that the executive function such shuts down. Yes. Right? So when the executive function shuts down, you already told me that the person doesn't mean that the person is like a walking idiot, right? They're able to have gross motor skills. That's correct. Okay. And that would uh, mean somebody who is familiar with doing certain things would be able to do them still, right? If it's something that they do frequently, yes. Okay. And so... Uh, and so when we're talking then about somebody who's familiar with using a camera... Deleting photos uh, would be something, if they do that frequently, then that would be something that they would be able to do, right? That's different from choosing photos to delete. Which photos to delete? Well, okay, so now, well, what if they were all deleted? If they're familiar with that camera, then it's possible that it would be considered a gross motor movement. Okay. And then that would be something that someone can do in fight or flight, right? If they, going back to deleting every photo on there? Yes. It's possible. Okay. And in talking about the organization and, and the planning that supposedly went on after Mr. Alexander had been killed, you're aware that the camera with all of the photos were actually found in the house in the washer, right? Yes. And the camera that had all these photos of Miss Arias and, and Mr. Alexander on it was uh, intact in the washer, wasn't it? My understanding is that the photos were deleted and that there, it, it gave the appearance that it had gone through a cycle. So I don't, if it, I don't know if it was intact. Well, intact meaning that the camera was still in one piece, right? After being ran through the washing machine? Well, you don't know that it was run through the washing machine, do you? I, I, I don't know definitively. No, you don't. So what I'm asking you is if the camera itself was in one piece. Do you know this or no? I believe so. Okay. And the camera had in it, you're aware that it had the SD card, right? Would that be the card that holds the, the memory card? Yes, the memory card. Yes. And the memory card, you're aware, wasn't destroyed in any way, was it? I don't know if it was destroyed. Okay. And... So you didn't, you didn't follow up to find out if these photos, uh, if the SD card or the memory card, if it was intact or not? You don't have any knowledge about that? I just know they were deleted. Okay. I don't know if it was destroyed. Okay, so in the when you reviewed the police report, that fact wasn't important you for you to remember? <laughs> was it not important? I didn't see that in there, that it was destroyed or not. Okay, so you didn't see in the police report then that the SD card was pulled out of the camera and it was used by the police to pull these photographs off? I knew that they had to get it off somehow, but I, I'm not knowledgeable about cameras in particular and how that process would work. Okay. But on direct, it was important to you to, to note that the bathroom had been, had poured water, that someone had poured water on the floor, attempted to clean, right? That was important to you? That was important to me. And that was something that you retained in your memory when reading the police reports, right? Right. Okay. But it's not important to you when you're talking about organization and planning to note that this camera that has all the evidence of Miss Arias being at the scene during this, during this situation, that the camera was left in a washer, completely intact, with the SD card with all the pictures on it. Right. The important part that stood out for me of that was that it was deleted. Okay. And you didn't find that uh, the fact that the camera was strangely left in a washer, you didn't find that strange then? Strange? Yes, that a camera would be in a washer? 
My understanding of the records, like I highlighted earlier, was that it had been through a cycle. That you, there was some evidence that it had been put through a cycle. So did I find that strange? I, well, let me ask you this. So you think that there's some evidence that the camera went through a cycle? That was my understanding. From reading the police reports? That's, I believe so. That was my understanding, that it was damaged <coughs> by, or tried to be damaged in some way by putting, being put through a cycle. Okay. So what, I guess what, what I'm trying to ask you is, is the point that you find it important that there's cleanup in the bathroom, right? Yes. Okay. But yet you don't find it important as to someone's ability to organize or plan when they leave then behind the most important piece of evidence, which is the evidence that she was there. You don't find that important. Judge, Rule 702, most important. Thanks. Do you find it important? What part? That she left the camera behind that has all the evidence of her being there. Did that in any way figure into your opinion with regard to this organization and planning afterwards? Yes, the fact that it was deleted. So just the fact that it was deleted, but the fact that she left it there at the scene was not important? The fact that it, it was my understanding that it was put through a cycle I'm was asking, important, yes, that it was left behind and put through a cycle. Okay, so the fact that it was... I'm not talking about the cycle. The fact mm -hmm. that the camera itself, with all the evidence on it and able to get by forensic people... That was not important to you? No, it's important. So you considered that then in this organization and planning, that all the evidence was left behind? Yes, I would consider that part of organization and planning. Leaving evidence behind for someone to find? And then putting it through a cycle. Leaving and evidence, what I'm asking you, Dr. DeMarte, is so then you agree with me that, this, that leaving evidence behind at a scene, at a crime scene, you find that to be evidence of organization? Yes, the way it was done, yes. Okay, all right. Because when somebody leaves evidence of themselves being, being there at a crime scene, that's evidence of organization to you, right? Because there was deleting that occurred. Okay, all right. You talked about the pattern of memory uh, getting worse instead of better. Do you remember that? I talked, about direct. The, I talked about the pattern of memory getting better. Oh, you're right. I'm sorry. Getting better instead of worse or staying the same, right? In typical traumatic memories, is that what you're referring to? No, no. Let me start over. Okay. okay when you were asking, when you were answering questions by Mr. Martinez, yes. you talked about uh, Jody's memory, right? Yes. And when you talked about her memory, you said that it seemed to be getting worse rather than better that she wasn't recalling any new memories. Instead, it seemed to be getting worse for you. That's correct. Okay. Uh, and, that, and you base that opinion on the fact that because you believe that she told Dr. Samuels that she got rid of the weapons. That's what you said, right? Yes, that's what he had in his report. Okay. Well, what he actually had in his report was that she, was, that she threw the gun away, right? That's what she had. That's what he had. That she threw the, the gun away. Got rid of the gun. And then changed her clothing. Right. Okay. So he didn't talk about weapons in plural, did he? I'd have to reference his uh, report to be specific about that. Okay. And she doesn't have a specific memory as to where the knife went, right? She told me that she had a vague memory. The vague memory of putting it in a dishwasher, right? That's correct. But she also told you that she doesn't know if that's a real memory or if that's something that she's remembering from before, like some other time, right? That's how she described it. Okay. And to you, it was important that uh, this information was told to Dr. Samuels, you think, before she spoke to you, right? Yes. And so, in other words, you think that she had more information uh, before she, when she spoke to Dr. Samuels and less information when she talked to you? Yes. Okay. And uh, we've been over this, I think, ad nauseum, but you spent about 12 and a half hours with Miss Arias, right? That's correct. And you're aware, do you know how much time Dr. Samuels spent with her? I know he went back and saw her several times. I don't know the exact number of hours. Okay. Well, you know he spent about 25 to 30 hours with her. Does that sound about right? I just said that I don't know. Okay. So you don't have any idea? I know that he saw her several times. That's oh. all I know. All right. Well, you know that he saw her several times and he went to see her after you saw her, right? The date on his report the, where it says conclusion of the evaluation was prior to when I saw her. Okay. So you're not aware of the fact that he went to see her after that report to talk about new information that was received? 
Foundation, new information. Okay, answer? The report that I had, that's where the information was already included in. When um, I did see that he added an addendum later on, but it was a separate piece of paper. What I'm referring to was the actual report where he put the conclusion date on there, which was prior to when I saw him. Okay, so you're not talking about the addendum then? No, I'm not talking about the addendum. Okay, because there was an addendum, you know that he went back to see her again, right? Yes. And you'd agree that he spent more time talking to Ms. Arias than you did, right? According to the hours that you just gave me, if those are accurate, then the answer would be yes. All right. And so uh, it's certainly conceivable, given the amount of time that he spent with her versus the time that you spent with her, she might have given him more information, right? She if, had long, is that right? If they spent more hours together, then, then yes, yes, he would have collected more information. You also testified that you found it unbelievable that uh, when Jody is driving towards Hoover Dam and she realizes that she has blood on her hands. Do you remember talking about that? I do remember talking about that. Okay, and you said that you found it unbelievable that when she saw that she had blood on her hands, she knew something bad had happened, right? No, that's not what I said. Well, but you and she's told you that, right? That she knew something bad had happened? That she had killed him. Right, and, and knowing that something bad had happened, right? That would fall under the category of something bad. Okay, and that based on... Uh, you find it to be unbelievable that she would not know that she, that she would make that statement that um, that she thought she had killed him, right? You find that to be unbelievable. Uh, per her report that she had no memory of what happened, I find that unbelievable. Okay. But also per her same report that she told you, the, her last memories were after she shot him, right? Yes. So she remembers shooting him. Shooting Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. And she remembers him coming after her as she's shooting, right? Yes. And she remembers that after she shoots him, he falls on top of her, right? Yes. And she remembers that she had to roll away from him, right? Yes. And she remembers that she had to run down the hall. Yes. And that she remembers that she's running away from him. Yes. And she remembers the last thing that he tells her is, I'm going to fucking kill you, bitch, right? As he was running after her. Yes. Yes. Okay, so given all the things that she does remember up until that point, it's not a huge leap to think that something bad had happened when blood is on her hands, right? You're using different words now. No, I'm just asking you, generally speaking. It's not a huge leap to assume that something bad happened when she sees bloods on her hand. It's what? a huge, it, it, I disagree. So you think that that's not a logical leap then? I agree that that's not a logical leap. Okay, so... <laughs> All right, so it's not logical then to assume that something bad had happened when you know that you just shot somebody and you know he was coming after you and you know that you were terrified and then hours later you see blood on your hands. You're using the word something bad that happened and I'm referring to the fact that she said, I knew I killed him. I, I know, but I'm not talking about that right now. I'm just asking you the simple question of whether or not it's a logical leap for someone to assume something bad happened after we have all this, this, these facts going on. If you're... Approach. May I continue? All right, Dr. Demarte, let, I just I want to make sure that I'm clear with this question, okay? okay? All right. So I'm not speaking about anything that Ms. Arias told you, okay? Do you understand that? So it's hypothetical? Sure, let's do it as a hypothetical if that helps, okay? Okay. Okay. So for someone to look down at their hands and see blood on them, okay? Knowing that just before that, they were in a situation where they had to shoot somebody, that somebody was coming after them, and that that somebody was threatening their life, okay? In that situation, it's not a huge leap, is it, for that person to say something bad might have happened? Sure, looking at that broad category that's not related to this case, yes, I could see that. So you that can agree with not, me on that. That then. it wouldn't be a broad leap to see blood and say something bad happened. Okay, so you can agree with me on that then, right? Yes. Okay, so now let's take it one step further. <laughs> Knowing that Miss Arias had to just, was just in a situation where she had to shoot Mr. Alexander, where he fell on top of her, where he came after her, where she was terrified and she was fearful for her own life. And then seeing blood on her hands, understanding that it's not her blood. You think that, 
That's not really a huge leap, is it, to think that she might have killed him? Sustained. Whether it's her own blood or not, it's not a huge leap, is it, to say that I might have killed him, knowing that everything that just happened, everything that she remembers about just happening. As I stated before, it is a huge leap. Okay, and that's a huge leap for you. That's what your personal opinion, isn't it? That is my opinion. Okay, it's your personal opinion, right? It's my opinion as a psychologist. <laughs> so I understand it's your opinion as a psychologist, but, but it's an opinion that you yourself make, right? <laughs> I'm a psychologist and I made that opinion based on my knowledge of memory and how memory works. Okay. And so because it's you as a person making this, making this opinion, based on even being a psychologist, it's still a subjective opinion, isn't it? And when you use the word subjective, what do you mean by that? I mean that it's an opinion based on what your own thoughts are and your own experiences. And on my education and understanding of how memory works. So you agree with me then that it's subjective? I would say it's based on my understanding of how memory works. So it's not subjective? Are you saying it's objective? I think that's an objective piece of data that was given to me. I'm not talking about the data. I'm talking about your opinion as to whether or not this is a huge leap or not. You, you can't agree with me that that's subjective? I think there's a, enough objective data to suggest that that couldn't have happened. I'm not talking about the data. I'm talking about your opinion. Your opinion alone. When we talk about your opinion, can you not agree with me that that's a subjective opinion? Yes, it's my opinion based on information that I know about memory. Yes, so it's subjective then. If, that, if those are the words that you're using, then yes. Yes, you agree. Yes, those are the words that you're using. Okay, well, I, I know I'm using them, but I'm asking you if you're agreeing with me. It that's sounds like that's what you believe the definition to be, so yes, that's... Then you agree with me? Yes. Okay. You talked about another report from Dr. Uh, Dr. Karp? Yes. And you're aware in that report, Dr. Karp conducted several tests with Ms. Arias, right? Yes. And those tests included the TSI? Yes. And that's the trauma symptom inventory? Correct. And that's the test that measures trauma, right? And general um, emotional distress. Okay. Uh, and she also did the Beck depression inventory? Yes. And what is that? It's um, a self-report measure that measures depression. Okay. And um, another inventory taken from pattern changing for abused women? Yes. Okay. And do you know what that is? I believe that was a measure of um, uh, background exposure to violence. Okay. And the WALMYR assessment scales, the partner abuse scale, do you know what that is? Yes. What's that? It's, again, a self-report measure of exposure to domestic violence. Okay. And there's two of those, right? One for physical and one for non-physical abuse. That's correct. Okay. And both of those were given, right? That's correct. And when you say self-report, that means that, these, that there are a bunch of questions in these reports, right? Yes. And the person is meant to answer these questions. Yes. And when these questions are posed, they're posed in a way that... Uh, whether, the, whether or not the person believes it to be abuse, they're just simply asked factual questions, factual situations, right? What person were you referring to? The person who's answering these questions. So ask that question again. Okay. So when the assessment scales, the partner abuse scales, when those, when those um, tools are used, they're asking the person who's using it, and let's just talk about Jody. When they're asking Jody, uh, they're just questions that she's answering, right? She's answering questions. Okay. And those questions um, are asking her specific about specific situations, right? Yes. And then the idea is, is that of these, of these assessments is that from, from seeing those answers to these assessments, the psychologist makes a decision as to whether or not there is abuse, right? Yes. It's not Miss Arias who's making that determination, right? Correct. It's based on her response. Right. And you didn't give any of these assessments, right? That's correct. And during this time, uh, and the, you would agree that these assessments are very detailed questions? Yes. And so, and in these questions, they're not asking Miss Arias whether or not she believes the situations to be abusive, right? They're just asking her for factual situations. Correct. 
And when you spoke to Miss Arias, you talked to her, you specifically asked her what she thought was abusive, right? What do you mean by that? Well, you asked her about any physical incidents, right? I, yes. Okay. And when you talk about that, you sp were specifically referencing what she thought to be physically abusive, right? And I gave some examples to help her understand it. Okay. And, but that was your, that was your direct questions to her, right? What was? The question, uh, you're specifically asking her, tell me what, what you believe to be abusive. Tell me what he did that you think is abusive, right? Yes. And I think yesterday we established that you agree that battered women often minimize details, don't they? They do. Now, ultimately, you said your opinion was that Miss Arias has borderline personality disorder? Correct. And borderline personality disorder is something that uh, is, if, if you're going to diagnose that, you need to see evidence of that from a very young age, right? You need to see evidence of that sometime before the age of 18. Okay. And so, uh, so would it be enough if you see the evidence at age 17 and nothing before that? You usually see a pattern, as I described before, the pattern of personality tends to start developing relatively young, and you may see an escalation of those symptoms over time. Okay, so when you say relatively young, what do you mean? Again, personality starts developing in the toddler years and starts to um, become more solidified as they get older. Okay, and so when you're looking for patterns with relation to borderline personality, you would expect to see them, you said sometime before 18, but really wouldn't you expect to see them long before 18? Usually start seeing, um, at the point when they start becoming maladaptive is older than that, usually start to see it more in their teenage years. Okay, and, uh, and what you want to see is you want to see a pattern of it, right? Not just one incident. That's correct. And you'd agree that if the person has suffered from a trauma, that when you look at that trauma, you need to see the evidence of any type of borderline traits before the trauma, right? When you're talking about trauma in adulthood or you're talking about trauma in childhood? I'm talking, let's say trauma in adult. Okay. So, and let's speak about Miss Arias. So we know, let's let, assume for a second with me that she was trauma, that she had a traumatic event on June 4th, okay? Okay. And assume for me that that was traumatic for her, okay? Okay. And assume for me that abuse, the abusive, long-standing abusive and emotional uh, abuse that she suffered was traumatic for her as well, okay? Okay. And so if a person who you are diagnosing with borderline personality uh, has a traumatic event or traumatic events, you want to see evidence of borderline prior to the traumatic event. That would be correct. And that's what the DSM-4 tells you, doesn't it? Yes. And in fact, you want to see clear evidence of this pattern before any traumatic events. Yes. Right. Okay. All right, so on direct, you talked about the different criteria for borderlining, right? Yes. And the first criteria is frantic efforts to avoid real or imagined abandonment, right? Yes. And there is a word in there, frantic, right? Yes. So it's not just somebody who doesn't want to break up with their boyfriend. There's a lot more than that, right, when we're talking frantic? Yes. Uh, and you talked about that it, there's a strong desire to be attached to people, right? Yes. And as evidence for you, for borderline personality, for Jody, you find the fact that she moved to Mesa after she and Mr. Alexander broke up. You find that to be evidence? One piece of evidence. Okay. A data point, right? Yes. And so, uh, but you're aware that she moved to Mesa, uh, well, first of all, you're aware that this is, happens in July of 2007, right? Yes. Okay. And you talk about this happening after she and Mr. Alexander broke up, right? Yes. But you're aware that, that they never actually stopped talking to each other, right? They did not stop talking to each other. And in fact, Mr. Alexander continued his relationship with her after she broke up with him. You know this, right? Continued his sexual relationship with her. Well, he continued talking to her too, didn't he? Yes, he continued talking to her. And he continued uh, saying really nice things to her, didn't he? He sometimes did say nice things to her, yes. Yes, and he continued inviting her over his house. I saw a couple instances where he invited her, yes. Well, you know that they traveled together just a few months after she moved to Mesa, right? I'm aware that they did travel together. Okay. 
And uh, you talk about her overstepping boundaries because she checked his text messages. Yes. Right? Um, and she told you that she did that because she believed he was cheating on her, right? Yes. And in fact, she confirmed that by looking at his text messages. Yes. And then you also um, think that uh, that she looked at his Facebook as well. Numerous times. Okay. And you're aware that they actually traded passwords, right? Well, that's what I saw that she had said in her diary, and that mm -hmm. was in opposition to a conversation that they had in some written form. I don't know if it was instant messaging or text. Well, this conversation that you're referring to, when did it happen? I believe that conversation was in May. Right. So after she moved away from him, right? That would be the time frame after. Right. And the conversation that you're referring to is when they both stopped uh, that they both changed their passwords so neither one of them can look at each other's Facebooks anymore, right? Or MySpace. I don't know when that happened, but what I do know is that he indicated that she continued to look at her his Facebook account without his authorization. And you think that, and that's coming directly from Mr. Alexander's mouth? Yes. Well, not directly from his mouth. It's coming from written form. Written form, but something that he's supposedly typing, right? Not supposedly. I saw it, yes. Okay. Well, you weren't there when he typed it, is what I'm saying. Yes, I was not there. Okay. And so all of these things that you talk about with regard to the first criteria all have to do with Mr. Alexander, don't they? No, there's other instances. Well, not that you gave us on direct, right? The things that you talked about on direct were talking about just Mr. Alexander, the I'd timeline when she was dating him or in a relationship with him. I'd be happy to provide other examples if you'd like me to. No, I'm not asking you for that. I'm asking you about the when on direct, when the prosecutor was asking you for examples of why you believe she fit into the first criteria, the only examples that you gave us all had to do with Mr. Alexander, right? I don't recall exactly if that's all the examples I gave because I have several other examples. Okay, so you don't remember that the only examples you gave was had to do with Mr. Alexander? It sounds like that's the case if that's what you're telling me, but that's not what I, I don't remember if that's the case. Okay. I have numerous other examples if you'd like me to give them to you. No, no, I just want to talk about what, what you okay. talked to the prosecutor about. Okay. Um, the second one, the second one is a pattern, a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, right? Yes. Well, and actually, I'm sorry. Let me, um, let me go back to the efforts to avoid real and imagined abandonment for a second. Uh, you understand that uh, Miss Arias actually moved out of her home when she was a teenager, right? She left her parents? Yes. And she stayed with a boyfriend at the time? Yes. You know that she had several jobs during that time, right? She, as a teenager into her adulthood, she was always working, wasn't she? At many different jobs, yes. Okay. Well... How many different jobs when you say many? Um, she had told me that she had worked for several years in her father's restaurant and that yeah. she had also had it at, the, at a minimum of 10 different restaurant jobs. She and told you that she had 10 different that restaurant she had, jobs? Yes, I believe that's the case. I can reference my notes if that would be helpful. Sure, if you have them. Sure. And you don't have Sure. It's my whole notes that have been disclosed already. Okay. Just to know. Sure, you can mark the whole thing and then I can have that back. I was correct in what I said. That she told you 10 jobs? At a minimum, yes. Okay. And Amongst she, many other jobs. And did, so she had 10 restaurant jobs and more than that as well? 10, I'm referring to restaurant jobs, yes. Okay. And? And more as well, of different types of jobs. Different types of jobs be, 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 besides restaurant jobs? That's correct. What were these? She indicated that one was being a spa receptionist. Okay. She also indicated that um, at one point she was a caretaker, I believe, of a child. Okay. When was that? Let me see if I can find that in my sure. notes. Sure. And can you tell us the, what the number is? I'm sorry, I didn't ask you. The, on the green tag for your notes? On the back. 630. Okay, so you're referring to Exhibit 630. November 2007 to January of 2008. She was a caretaker for a young boy. Okay. All right. So so for a year, she was a caretaker for this little boy? Um, it doesn't appear that that's a year. What did you say? 2000? November 2007 to January of 2008. Oh, okay. All right. So 
uh, when you talk about this effort of uh, frantic effort to avoid real or imagined abandonment, you talk about it as being terrifying to be separated, right? Yes. Okay. Uh, and all right. And the second, uh, the second criteria you have is a pattern of unstable and intense interpersonal relationships, right? Correct. And you, you characterize that as a strong tendency to go from boyfriend to boyfriend, right? For Miss Arias. I characterize that? Are you talking about the symptom in general or how it specifically applies to her? How it applies to her. That was one example. Okay. So the fact that she had four boyfriends from the time that she was 14 up until now, that you characterize as going from boyfriend to boyfriend? That was also coming from uh, her childhood friend who also made that exact same comment. So that in combination to having these boyfriends back to back. Uh, her childhood friend who, who made a comment that she went from boyfriend to boyfriend? Yes. Okay. And her childhood friend isn't a psychologist like you, right? No, I was just highlighting another data point. Okay. So it's, this is something you're talking in a psychological, clinical evaluation type way, right? Right. Okay. And so you, as a psychologist, consider her going from boyfriend to boyfriend because she had four boyfriends from the time she was 14. Back to back. Back to back. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the fact that she was uh, with, let's say, Mr. Brewer for a total of four years, that is, doesn't characterize any stability for you? Oh, that shows stability. Okay. And the fact that she was missed with Mr. McCartney for two years, that would show stability as well, right? That shows stability. And the... The third one you talk about, the third criteria being identity disturbance, right? Yes. And that's markedly and persistently unstable self-image, right? Self-concept, yes. Self-image. Self-image. Okay. And for that, your evidence was the fact that she joined the Mormon church quickly, right? That was one. That was one of your data points that you used. Yes. Uh, and you're aware that when she joined the Mormon church, it was just two months after she met Mr. Alexander, right? Yes. So again, we're talking about a time period of Mr. Alexander. Yes. And it was, you're aware that after she met Mr. Alexander, within a week, he was sending Mormon missionaries to her house, right? No. Oh, you didn't know that? No. Oh, okay. And then, then did you not know that these Mormon missionaries came to her house once a week until she converted? No. You weren't aware of that? No. You didn't get that in your 12 hours? I didn't get that in my 12 hours. Okay. And the fifth one you talked about as recurrent suicidal behavior, gestures, or threats, right? Correct. And that also includes self-mutilating behavior. Correct. All right. And there's no self-mutilating behavior, right? None that I'm aware of. And you know of no actual threats she ever made to anybody to commit suicide, right? Prior to this traumatic event? Let's say prior to June 4th. I need a second to think about that. Sure. When you say actual threats, there was, um, I would consider this a threat. There were um, comments in her diary. And at that, that time, those comments in her diary, she didn't actually give a plan that she was going to kill herself, right? A specific plan, no. Okay. So what she was actually, any references to her diary prior to, this, to meeting Mr. Alexander, we're talking about that she had low self-image, right? That it wasn't worth her being alive, something to that effect. You're attaching a low self-image with suicide. I wouldn't do that. I would say that there were numerous comments um, beginning as early as 1995 of repeated suicidal <clears throat> mention of suicide and desire to commit suicide. Okay, but that, that's my question, though. When you're talking about these suicide, she's not giving an actual plan in her journal, right? She's not saying, I'm going to go home and take 30 pills so I can die tomorrow. That's right. I didn't see a specific plan in okay, there. Okay, so there was never a plan that you saw, right? In her journal, prior to any traumatic event. Prior traumatic event? Well, prior to meeting Mr. Alexander. Let's say that. Okay. I don't believe I saw a specific plan. Okay. And... Uh, to the other thing about uh, this suicide ideation is that you never saw any um, actual threats. We were talking about that. Now, 
you would consider it a threat because she writes it down in her own journal, right? A threat? Yes. No, I, I wouldn't use the word threat. I would say that it's an indication that she's idealizing and thinking about suicide behavior, which is what that symptom captures. Okay. And this symptom is actually meant to have actual threats of suicide, right? That's one of the things that it lists in the DSM. That's one in addition to idealizing and thinking about it. Okay, so now do you agree with me that you never saw any threats of her actually committing suicide prior to meeting Mr. Alexander? If you're talking, you're using the word threat and planning as, as though I'm they're not, the same thing. I use them differently. I'm not using planning, I'm talking about threat. So threat would be writing it down and indicating that it's, that there's some thought about it. Okay, and so you never saw, so for you that means threat? Yes. Okay. And she never threat had this threat made to anyone else that you know of, right? It was only in her own journal. No, that's not correct. So prior to meeting Mr. Alexander, that she threatened to commit suicide to somebody else? Her friend Zenia indicated that she had mentioned suicide to her. Oh, her friend from fifth grade, right? They met young, and she indicated that they... Um, sporadically kept in contact. Okay, and again, any reference to that wasn't an actual plan, was it? I don't, I don't know the details of that. I know she had just mentioned that she had been thinking about suicide. Okay, so you don't know the details, but not knowing the details didn't stop you from using it as a data point, right? It is a data point because, as you can read there in the DSM, it indicates that suicidal ideation is is what's captured under that symptom. What I'm, what I'm asking you is that then you didn't go and ask to interview this Zana person, right? To ask her specifically what she meant by any comments about suicide. No, because it didn't matter. There was the comment of suicide, which again is captured under that symptom. Okay, so just the comment of suicide, any comment of suicide. So anybody, anytime anybody says something like, I'm going to commit suicide or I wish I weren't here, that to you falls under this criteria? No, that's not what I said. What I'm saying is I look for a pattern of behavior, mm -hmm. and in this situation we're talking about suicide, so I'm looking for a pattern of suicidal ideation, and that's what matters. Well, isn't it true that this pattern that you speak of is really just comments by a teenager who talks about being depressed, right? No. So you don't count these as depressed comments? You're, you're meshing two different things together, again, that suicide specifically has to do with depression. Suicidal behavior can be seen in a number of different disorders as evidenced with Ms. Arias, who has borderline personality disorder. What I'm asking you is that when somebody talks about wishing they weren't here anymore or that their life isn't worth living, you don't see that as evidence of depression either? I'm saying that, yes, you can see that in depression amongst other disorders. All right. How many comments is it that you, that you saw? When you, and you're referring to just her journals then, right? Besides this Dana person, you're referring to just her journals? And her parents indicated the same. And how many comments is it that you're counting here? I didn't count them. Okay, so more than one? Oh, yes. Okay, more than 10? Are we talking back since 1995? Yes. I don't think that it, I, I can't give a specific number. I think it would be misleading to give a specific number. <laughs> so you just know more than one? more than definitely more than one several for it to be a pattern I would never consider something a pattern if I just saw it one time okay so several then yes all right several from 1995 yes you talked about the um, sixth one the effect of instability due to a marked reactivity of mood right correct and that you can see uh, what the DSM talks about is irritability or anxiety? Those are two things that are listed there. Okay, and anxiety usually lasting a few hours. Right? If you'd like for me to read it verbatim with you, I can do that also. Would you like me to pull that out? No, I'm reading it. Okay. I'm just asking, do you know this by memory or no? I know most of it by memory, but I wouldn't say that I have it memorized verbatim. Okay, well you'd agree that, that the effect of instability talks about anxiety that usually lasts a few hours and only rarely more than a few days, right? Right. Okay. And for this, you're, you're saying one of the examples that you used was that in her journals, right? In her journal entries, you would see that she would appear happy on one side of her journal um, and on the, on the same day or the next day even, she would be sad, right? That was one data point. Okay. And you're aware that, you, you talked about the law of attraction, right, on direct, a little bit? I said bit. that I was aware of it. Okay, and you are aware, and you can see evidence that, that Jody really paid a lot of attention to the law of attraction in her journals, right? Yes. 
And this was specific to uh, 2006 and on, right? I don't know the specific date, but I did see it in there numerous times. Okay. And the law of attraction, when she would speak of it, she would speak very positively, right? About her life and all the things that she was thankful for. Yes. Okay. And then she would talk, uh, sometimes then, that when she would speak negatively, she would speak about things about Mr. Alexander, right? Sometimes, yes. Okay, and she would talk about how Mr. Alexander, that it was upsetting to her that he would have harsh and critical words for her, right? I believe I saw one comment related to that. Okay, and that would, that would, uh, that created a sad type mood in her journal, didn't it, when she would talk about these things? I don't know that that was specifically related to him, no. You don't know if the harsh critical words were related to Mr. Alexander? I don't know the exact journal entry you're referring to. Would you like to show that to me? No, I'm asking, do you not remember it? You just told me you did. No, what I said is that I remember in her journal seeing the change from happy to sad. Okay. I don't know if it was specifically related to anything to do with Mr. Alexander. But you don't have any specific examples of those dates in her journal, right? I don't have those, no. Okay. And the chronic feelings of emptiness, what does that mean for the DSM? It's described as a person having a sense of just being empty inside, that there's nothing inside of them. Uh, you're using empty twice, so tell me what, it, nothing inside, what does that mean? Is that depression? Describe it for us. The feeling of just being empty, it's a common, it's a common descriptor that we see in patients who have that sense, that they say inside, I just feel like I don't have anything there. Okay, um, and you're saying that she told you this? She did. And uh, you, of course, spoke to her after uh, she's been charged with murder, right? Yes. And you, of course, spoke to her after she had to kill Mr. Alexander, Objection. right? Conclusion, had to kill. Approach. <laughs> So you, when you, when you spoke to Miss Arias, you spoke to her after she has already been charged with a crime, right? That's correct. Okay. And the other one that you have is inappropriate, intense anger or difficulty controlling anger, right? Yes. And in the DSM, it says, as an example, frequent displays of temper, constant anger, recurrent physical fights, right? Right. Uh, you don't have any evidence of recurrent physical fights, do you? No, just a, not recurrent physical fights, just the time that she had kicked her mom. Okay. Um, I'm asking you whether or not you have any evidence of constant anger. Internal anger, yes. Okay. And you get that evidence from where? Um, her family members who had indicated that this is a, something that they had seen in her um, throughout most of her life. Most of her life? Yes. Okay, but you're referring to, and, and I know you just wanted to throw out there the, the when she kicked her mom. That's something that happened when she was a teenager, right? She was younger, yes. Yes, and that's something that happened when she was arguing with her mom, right? I believe so. And you know that she was... I'm, I need to retract that. Okay, you don't know when it happened? No, that there was, if I remember correctly, there was an indication that her mother had made a, a kind, neutral comment to her, and the response was negative. Okay, that's, that's what your information is? I believe so, yes. Okay, so then I guess, are you aware that the fact that, that the time then when uh, Miss Arias was a teenager, that her mother would argue with her back, right? Do you know this? Would what? Her mother would argue with her. Yes, there, she indicated that there was a lot of arguing. Okay, and that her mother would hit her. Yes, that's what she reported to me. But the only thing that you want to take into account is that Miss Arias hit her back. No, that's right? not the only thing I want to take into account. Well, you're using that as a data point, right? That she hit her, yes, for that symptom, yes. And you're using it that as a data point for inappropriate and intense anger? As one data point, yes. Okay. And also, it talks about frequent displays of temper. You don't have that, do you? Do I have that? You don't have that as a data point for, for Jody. frequent displays of temper? Yes, that she, people would describe her as being irritable and upset. Okay, and uh, they also described her as being very happy, don't they? Yes, other people do describe her as that. And being very pleasant and kind. Yes. And they describe her as being very caring. Yes, some people do. Yes, and describe her as being very loving. Some people did describe her as that. I believe for this criteria, you wanted to use an email from Miss Arias 
to Mr. Alexander, right? On February 14th? Yes. And in this email, she says she's talking to Mr. Alexander, right? Through, I mean, through email, right? Yes. And I'm showing you exhibit number 623. Uh, and she's telling, she writes to Travis that she's sorry that the last few days have been frustrating for him, right? Yes. And she wishes that she can give him more consolation. Yes. And she says that she was at a loss for words. Right? Yes. And that she's a little bit intimidated. Not necessarily because of his anger, but she, she wasn't sure how he would react to her trying to comfort him, right? Yes. So she's talking about how she's trying to comfort him. Yes, she was. And she says that uh, she compares it to her own experiences that sometimes she doesn't want to hear it and she just wants to yell and scream and vent, right? Yes. And then she puts in quote in uh, parentheses, yes, I do, on very rare occasions, right? Yes. And then she wants to go, and that she talks about going through the motions until the situation plays itself out. Right? I'm still reading. Oh, okay. Yes. And she talks about needing comforting sometimes. Yes. And she talks about how her heart filled with compassion for Travis. Yes, she did. Okay. And when you were talking to the prosecutor about this email, you didn't go through any of this part, right? I have read that. Right. Not with the prosecutor on direct, right? You didn't tell the jury about it. Correct. We read the second paragraph. Okay. And it's clear from the first paragraph that apparently there is something there was something going on prior to February 14th between Mr. Ari that that Mr. Alexander was upset about, right? Yes. Cuz she's talking about his anger. About him being frustrated. Right, and and that in his anger too, right? Because of how angry you were. Yes. And then she goes on to talk about to kind of pump him up, doesn't she? When she says that after she hung up with him that she continued to cry for a few minutes. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Um, and so she's talking about how she was crying after she hangs up with Mr. Alexander. Yes. And that she was feeling miserable and hopeless and then suddenly she thought of him and she knew that um, she stopped crying and she began to feel wonderful, right? Is that what the rest of that says? Yes. Do you need to read it? Go ahead. I see the part that you're referencing now. And she talks about how lucky she is to have him in her, uh, in her life, right? Yes. And so saying this to somebody, it would make them feel good, wouldn't it? They're kind words. Yeah. And so she's saying kind words to him, isn't she? Yes. And she talks uh, about <clears throat> the future and how... Um, talking about today's she's specifically referencing today's lesson has been difficult and was not fun but the general idea is that once we learn the lessons that we don't repeat them anymore right she's talking in a very positive manner with him isn't she yes and that she uh, and that she hopes that he feels better and to remember that no matter how ugly it gets that she's just a phone call away right yes When you went through this email with the prosecutor on direct, you didn't tell the jury any of the other kind words that Miss Arias had to say, right? Right. And knowing that you were going to use this email as a data point in your diagnosis to borderline, um, you didn't talk to Jody about it, right? Did I talk to her about? About the email? No. You never asked her what she specifically meant when she talks what, the part that you use is that she says that she's never beaten anybody up, but she, her anger, she's kicked holes in walls and kicked down doors and smashed windows, right? Right. And knowing that you were going to use this as a data point, as you say, you never talked to her about it, right? I don't believe I'd read it at that point. Okay, so you never went back and talked to her about it? No, I didn't go back. You never asked to clarify, well, what did you mean by this, Jody? How often did this happen? You didn't ask her those questions? No. And you didn't ask her then... 
Uh, so you have no idea if what she says in this paragraph is true or not, right? Just like with everything else, it's just another data point. Okay. But it's a data point that you used to form a criteria or an opinion about borderline personality, right? Not independently. You used it to form one of the things to form your opinion about borderline personality, right? As one of the pieces of information, yes, I did. All right, you conducted uh, uh, the MMPI, right? Yes. Can you tell us what that is? It's a self-report measure. Um, it, there's a 567 questions, true or false. It captures personality traits in general psychopathology. And this was a test that you gave, right? Yes. Uh, and in this test, you said you computer scored it? Yes. Uh, and you said you did it twice? Did I hear you say that or no? The computer makes you do it twice. Okay. So that's acceptable then to score the MMPI twice because the computer makes you do it? It's part of the protocol when you're entering it. Okay. So part of the... And which computer scoring company did you use? This is with... Um, I believe it's Pearson. Pearson. Okay. I'd have to double check on that. All right. And do you it's have... It's called QLocal. Uh, I'm sorry? I'm sorry. It's called QLocal is the name of it. Okay. And do you have your, um, the computer, uh, when you put it into the computer and, and it scores it, it spits you out something like graphs and charts, things like that, right? Yes, T-scores. And, and do you have that with you? I do. Can you take those out, please? Sure. And I'm looking for all the scales. Because you, you said you did all of the scales, right? Not just, uh, not just the validity and clinical. Right. Ladies and gentlemen, please be back in the jury room at 11.15, and we will start promptly at that time. Please remember the admonition. Please stand to the jury. Please be seated. Please be seated. The record will show the presence of the jury, the defendant, and all counsel. Ms. Wilmot, you may continue. On direct examination, you talked about some, some of the written statements uh, that have been made that you've reviewed in this case, right? Yes. And you talked about uh, how you don't, you don't want to go behind the meaning of the words. Yes. And so you just want to look at the words and, that, and use that as a data point, right? Yes. And in looking at the words, and you, and you basically get different data points from all over then, right? Yes. That you pull together, right? Yes. Okay. And you're familiar with a, an email, string of emails that went back and forth between Mr. Alexander and Mr. and Mrs. Hughes? Yes. And you know in this email then that at one point, Mr. Alexander, he's talking very highly of Miss Arias, isn't he? Yes. And how much he really like, well, the, how much he really is into her, right? That he was interested in her, yes. Right, and that he adores her. I don't recall those exact words. If you want to show me, I'm happy to look at it. I'm not speaking in exact words, but oh. the context of the email itself, he's very fond of her, isn't he? He felt fondly of her, yes. And he actually in his own words, talks about that everybody can agree that they don't get more honest than Jody, right? I don't know that specifically, but I, again, I'd be happy to look at sure. the email you're referring to. May I approach? May. Six, seven, five, eight, nine. At the top of the page. The part that's underlined, yes. Yes, okay. And so... And so he's talking then about the fact that they don't come more honest than Jody, right? Yes, that's what he said. And that's something that is in written word. Yes. Something that you don't want to go behind the meaning of, right? right? And you'll use that as a data point. Yes. And you'll also use as data points the fact that uh, Mr. Alexander was very fond of Miss Arius. Yes. And that he speaks very highly of her. He did in that email. And that he worries that 
the things that Mr. Miss that Mr. And Mrs. Hughes said to her was upsetting for Jody. Yes. Right? And when we go down the road to May 26th of 2008, you're familiar with an a uh, instant messaging, right? Instant messaging between uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Alexander and Miss Arias. There were there were several different ones. Which one are you referring to? May 26th. I don't know that exact date. Okay, like but you reviewed all these instant messages, yes. right? Yes. Okay. And part of your review of the instant messages, you also reviewed the text messages. Yes. And in reviewing those things, you you would agree that there were times when Mr. Alexander was quite upset with Jody, right? Yes. And he showed his anger with Jody in his text messages, didn't he? Yes. And he called her all kinds of names. He called her names, yes. And do you know what character assassination is? Yes. And isn't that when names become actually so severe that it cuts down the person's own character, their own being? I think that would be one definition, yes. Okay. And you'd agree that a lot of these names that he was calling her was actually character assassination, wasn't it? They were harsh names, yes. And you wouldn't consider that to be okay? No, that's not okay. And in fact, that was abusive, wasn't it? Abuse implies that it's a pattern of behavior. I would say that that behavior was certainly inappropriate and not a healthy communication style. Okay, but you don't consider it abusive? I would say, again, the word abuse implies a pattern of behavior. Well, let's not, we can talk about patterns in a second, okay. but the word, I'm talking about the word abuse. So you mean that unless it's repeated, this one particular instant wouldn't be considered abusive to you? If we define abuse as a misuse of something? No, Dr. Just Marte, a misuse, yes. Hold on a second. What I'm asking you is this one particular instant, on May 26, let's say, when Mr. Alexander, as you've agreed, was calling her names consistent yes. with character assassination. You, would, you wouldn't agree that that's abusive? I'm trying to explain to you what I mean. Well, I'm asking, you're telling me that abuse is a pattern, so if it's, if it's just one instant, then is that not abuse? I'd like to clarify, can I speak? It's a yes or no question. I don't believe I can answer in yes or no. All right, so then, so then that's a no. No, I just said I can't answer you in yes or no. All right, so then let's talk about patterns. You want to talk about patterns, and, and when we talk about abuse, you want to look for more than one instance of it, right? For you to characterize it as abuse? I, again, would like to clarify that. Do you want to see a pattern when you're looking at abuse? I'd like to clarify that. Clarify the fact that what whether or not you want to look at a pattern? <laughs> what I've been trying to clarify. I, I, I'm moving on, so I'm just asking the question, do you want to see a pattern when you're looking for abuse? It depends on how the word abuse is used. That's what I'm trying to explain to you. If it's implied that there's a pattern, no. If you're talking about the word abuse as being a misuse of something in one instance, then you can use the word abuse in a single incident, yes. Okay. Is that, did you clarify enough? I did, thank you. All right, you're welcome. So what I'm asking you is when you're looking at abuse in a relationship, do you look for patterns? Yes. Okay. And when you, some of this abuse, you would agree that it can be psychological abuse, right? Yes. And in fact, psychological abuse can be very damaging to a person, right? It can be damaging. Um, and when we look at psychological abuse, you can look at the written word, right? Yes. And so on May 26th, when Mr. Alexander is calling uh, Miss Arias a freaking whore, do you consider that particular word to be bad? Yes. Do you consider it to be mean? Yes. Do you consider it to be a word that you'd cap, uh, that cuts her down? Yes. Do you consider it to be mean when he talks about uh, that he's never had to deal with a more solid form of evil? Is that mean? Those are not kind words. So is that mean then? Yes, I would put it in that category. Okay. And when you talk about this conversation on May 26th, if you know that he has called her these types of names before this, let's talk about May 10th, or if he's called her names on April 8th or April 7th or March 30th, don't we start to see a pattern? Are you talking about a hypothetical? No, I'm asking, you've read through the text messages, right? I have. And you know that he calls her names, right? Very rarely, yes. 
You think very rarely he yes, calls I her names? Yes, I would say that. Okay. And so, uh, how do you define rare? I would say that it happened periodically, the pattern that I saw, that it was in response to him feeling like she was being intrusive or had crossed a boundary. Um, and he was putting up very firm boundaries. That's not what I'm asking you. I'm talking about rare. So and rare is once or twice or more. How, are you asking me in this situation how many times it happened or just no, the definition I'm of rare? You, you said he rarely was abusive right. to her. Yes. So, um, and actually you said he rarely called her names. But are you yes. going to use the word abusive with that or just calling names? Calling names. Okay. And so you consider... The, all the numerous text messages that you've read and the numerous instant messages that you've read between the two of them, you would consider any time he ever called her names, that was just happened rarely, right? I would say that it happened infrequently. I think that's a better word. Frequently? Infrequently. Oh, infrequently. Better than rarely. That's probably a word that I would use, yes. And infrequently is, is what then? It's not you? often. It's a handful of times. Okay. And so a handful of times then becomes what, less relevant to you? No, that's not less relevant. So it's more relevant? No, it's relevant. It's relevant, okay. Yes. And when you're talking about then this, uh, um, do you think it's acceptable behavior for him to act like this? I think any time people speak to each other like that, that's not acceptable behavior. Okay, so you'd agree that he was acting in an unacceptable way, right? He had an unhealthy communication pattern. Oh, he had an unhealthy... So in he those spoke, moments. So he spoke enough times to her in this manner that you would say that it was an unhealthy communication pattern, right? In those moments. You just called it a pattern, right? Yes, in those moments. No, you just called it a pattern. You're talking about the unhealthy communication he had with her as a pattern, right? In those exchanges. There were lengthy exchanges. That's so now, what I was referring to. The so pattern now, within the exchanges. So now you want to call it a pattern when you're just talking about one conversation? Within the exchanges. They were long exchanges. Right. So these long exchanges, just one exchange is considered a pattern to you? In the way that they were written between the two of them, they were long exchanges between the two of them. So within that Within that exchange, yes, I would say that there was a pattern in that response. Okay, so within that one response, you're going to say there's a pattern of how he responds. Because he used multiple different words, like you just highlighted. So there is a pattern in his response in, in these responses, right? In those exchanges, yes. Okay, and in this pattern of his responses, you see a pattern of him being, of calling her bad names, right? Yes, the pattern I see is that he's responding. The pattern that you see in these exchanges is one of him calling her bad names, right? Yes. Okay. And assaulting her character, right? Yes. And calling her names like whore. Yes. And slut. Yes? I don't remember that specifically, but if you have it in front of you, I'd be happy to look at it. You don't remember him calling her a slut? That name in particular, no. Okay. It's possible. Well, I could you look at it. Okay. Well, you remember uh, that he talks about having her living a life identical to Satan. Do you I remember do that? I do recall something similar to that. And telling her that she's worthless. Do you remember that? Something similar to that. You remember him calling her a three-hole wonder? I do remember that. And so in this pattern of during this conversation, he is being abusive, isn't he? Yes, he was using words that were very unkind and maladaptive. Okay, and so this is the instant messaging that happens on May 26th. There's mm -hmm. also uh, a text message from May 26th, isn't there? Do you remember that? I remember there were numerous text messages. I'd be happy to look at it. All right, well, you understand that, that the instant messaging on May 26th is preceded by text messages, or, or do you not remember that? I know that there was... Um, IMs and also uh, text messages. Okay. And so in text messages, he also called her names, didn't he? I don't know if it's that specific date. Again, I'd like to see the documents that you're referring to. Well, let's not talk about a specific date. Okay. Just in text messages that re you reviewed, you know that there were messages, these um, conversations between the two of them that you would characterize as a pattern, right? I would say that they were infrequent comments that were made. No, you called it a pattern earlier. Are you taking that back? I'm not taking anything back. You're changing my words. No, 
Did you not just say pattern just a few minutes ago? I said pattern in those specific exchanges, that there was a pattern within. You're talking about now a pattern across. That's a very different presentation. No, I'm not talking about that. So may, let me make sure that you understand Please me, okay? Clarify. So I'm talking about in a specific text message conversation. You read through all their text messages, didn't you? I did. Okay. And when you read through the text messages, did you see within, uh, let's talk about just one conversation, when he's upset with her? Yes. Just any particular one. Okay. Within that conversation, you see a pattern, don't you, of him calling her bad names again? Within the text messages, yes. Okay. So we have one that we know of from, March, from May 26th, right? That's the date you gave me, yes. Okay. And then you've seen another conversation when he is extremely uh, calling her bad names, right? Yes. And you consider that to be another pattern within that conversation. Are you now highlight highlighting a third instance, or are you still talking about that second, second. one? Yes. Okay. And uh, you had other um, communications, uh, or they, you reviewed other communications between them, where there was a third time when he is calling her bad names, right? I'd like to see that. Do you not remember that? I remember that there, again, were infrequent um, situations. Well, I know you, you keep wanting to say infrequent, but you're not giving me any information as to that infrequency. We're, what we're talking about here is specific conversations where you're telling me within this conversation there is a pattern of him uh, calling her bad names and yes. character assassination, right? Just right, date and time conversation. No. Oh, no. What I'm saying to you is that in order to be accurate in how I respond, I'd like to see what you're referring to so that I'm not misleading in any kind of way. Because you wouldn't want to be misleading, right? Correct. And you wouldn't want to, uh, you wouldn't want to add anything into your answers just to mislead people, right? Right. I don't want to mislead anybody. Okay. So, so we can agree then that, that you would want to just answer the questions as they're posed so that you don't give any misleading information. Right. Okay. You were asked questions about uh, when Mr. Alexander made comments about being afraid of Miss Arius, right? Yes. And that you wouldn't want to go behind those words, right? Right. You wouldn't want to do any further investigation as to why he might say something like that, right? I can't do that. He's not alive. Right. But you wouldn't want to use any of your other data points to, to investigate why he might say that? I would use this as an objective data point that I would then use in addition to everything else, putting it together. But I wouldn't alter the words. It's not possible to alter the words. No, you wouldn't want to alter the words, but wouldn't you want to understand and put those words in context? And would I look at it in context? Yes, I would look at it right. in context. And you would want to look at then behaviors and investigate maybe uh, whether or not this, there's any true meaning behind these words, right? I couldn't do that because he's not alive. You, um, so when somebody's not alive, you can't get any information from them. Is that what you mean? From them directly? That's correct because they're not alive. So you can't make any type of, you can't make any type of, um, do any type of an evaluation as to anything that he says in written word because you can't look at other data points with regard to Mr. Alexander. No, you, um, what I was referring to is what we started talking about was going behind the word and getting more information about those words in particular. That's what I was speaking about. Right. And so to try and go, to try and get, put meaning to that word, what I'm saying is, is that you don't want to look at any other data points that relate to what he's saying in these words, right? No, I would absolutely look at other data points, but I wouldn't change the actual wording. I wouldn't be able to go behind it, but I'd well, be able to have other data points that I would then integrate. Right. So... May, may approach very quick. Yes. This time, please be back in the designated area at 125. Please remember the admonition. You are excused. Please stand for the jury. The record will show the jury has left the courtroom. Counsel, anything before the noon recess? No, thank you. We are at recess.